I host a Facebook group called The Social Exchange, named after this podcast, and I am happy to report it's a civil space where people can have discussions about difficult issues and where people can disagree and still get along as people. It's not perfect, but I'd say that the group is a rare space where people with diverse opinions can unite. It leans a little bit liberal. Um, you know, I don't mean it to. I lean liberal, so I probably do have influences in that sense. I, I, I'm not trying to. It's supposed to be a completely heterodox group where diverse ideas are discussed. Some of my conservative friends have left the group, and some of my more far-left leaning friends have left the group because they don't feel like they were able to adequately represent themselves that, or they felt like they weren't represented in the group. But I have to say that, you know, I just I try to improve all the time and I try to shift the norms so that those things don't happen. But a part of that's on them because I notice that the people who are leaving the group are saying that it's, it's not interesting or they don't like the conversations are usually people who are trying to stir up the pot and they're not really in it you know, in good faith or to try to enhance some kind of learning or anything like that. So, you know, they're libertarians, conservatives, classical liberals, leftists, progressives all in the group. Again, it's named after the, the Facebook group is named after the podcast, The Social Exchange. And anybody listening to this right now is welcome to join as long as you're willing to adhere to some basic norms around having logical and civil discussions. All that to say... I'm going to start podcasting about some of the discussions in that group just to give my two cents on issues that I think are particularly interesting to me or things that I have thought about already or would like to think about kind of out loud. I'll never mention anybody by name when I do this, but I've always wanted to try and I figured today would be a good day. Um, recently, someone left a comment and that's what inspired this podcast episode. I have it written down here, and I'm just going to read it. It says, quote, I know Zach has talked about cognitive dissonance in this space previously. It's worth another discussion, as I can't comprehend that thousands upon thousands of people, especially now in South Dakota, still believe the pandemic is a concoction of the fake news. They deny that they are suffering from the virus and tell hospitals that there is another reason they're sick because COVID-19 is not real. Even the governor, Christy Nome, continues to say, my people are happy because they're free in response to mandating masks and other restrictions. All the while, the test positivity rate in South Dakota is an astonishing 58%. I know South Dakota is not the only state with this dissonance. What will it take? What can it take for these people to accept the science and the reality of this insidious virus? End quote. All right, let me just tell you a few things before I respond to the question directly. First, it is a huge goal of mine to become a better speaker. I want to be able to think out loud coherently, without babbling, without rambling, so that I can optimize for times when I'm giving a speech or like um, doing an interview or just trying to articulate my positions socially or in the workplace a little bit better. So besides the question that I just read, I have nothing written in front of me, and I'm going to answer that question in one take. No editing along the way. I'm not going to stop the recording or play it again or try it again. The one exception is that in doing so, I'm going to allow myself to take really long pauses. So I might actually sweep back through the recording and just shorten the, the pauses if they're too long, just for your listening sake. Other than that, this is one take. And no promises that it's going to be perfect, but I'm going to give it a try. And besides my practicing being a better speaker... I also think that it's going to be interesting for listeners to witness my thought process, just the way that I think about things and sort out problems out loud. I'm able to sort of think audibly pretty well. When I'm talking, it's a pretty good reflection of my thoughts, for better or worse. Um, even if I don't do a perfect job or reach a correct conclusion, I still thought it might be interesting. But anyway, I just thought it'd be fair to tell you that I'm trying this recording out as an experiment. I may fail, and I'm going to go ahead and take that chance, and yeah, you'll hear this recording whether it sucks or not. Let me read the question one more time, and I'll respond without further preamble. Quote, I know Zach has talked about cognitive dissonance in this space previously. It's worth another discussion, as I cannot comprehend that thousands upon thousands of people, especially now in South Dakota, still believe the pandemic is a concoction of the fake news. They deny that they're suffering from the virus and tell hospitals there's another reason they're sick, because COVID-19 is not real. Even the governor, Christy Nome, continues to say, 
quote, my people are happy because they're free, end quote. In response to mandating masks and other restrictions, all the while, the test positivity rate in South Dakota is an astonishing 58%. I know South Dakota is not the only state with this dissonance. What will it take? What can it take for these people to accept the science and the reality of this insidious virus? I am tempted to dive in right into the meat of this question about COVID-19 and science denial and believing that news is fake and the pandemic and the hoax. But let me tease apart cognitive dissonance for a second. I'm going to try to define it as I understand it and then offer up an example of what it is and what it looks like. And that way we're on the same page. Cognitive dissonance is a psychological phenomenon that happens when a person holds two incompatible beliefs simultaneously. They hold two beliefs even though the beliefs aren't compatible. They can't both be true. And why would a person believe two incompatible things? Usually because a person already holds a worldview or they're already behaving in some way and that behavior feels core to their sense of self already and then they're presented with evidence that something contrary to the worldview or or the behavior is actually correct. So it's like being told, you know, the essence of who you are, everything about you, it's all wrong. And so cog- that's cognitive dissonance. What we're really talking about when we say cognitive dissonance being like a, a logical fallacy is when people reduce their dissonance because it's like a self-preservation tactic. One example that comes up for me, if I just turn it to myself, is that I eat meat despite believing that it's actually ethically wrong that I do so. I'm just used to eating meat, um, but I've been a vegetarian for years at a time in the past, and it's tough for me to stay on that diet, and I probably could remain a vegetarian if I were more thoughtful, but I have succumbed for now to define my ethics eating meat because it tastes good and it's an easy way to get my nutrients, and I prioritize other ob- ethical obligations instead. Like So never mind whether you agree or disagree that eating meat is ethical or not ethical, I just happen to believe that it's not ethical. That's not really the important part. Let's just say that I'm right about that. So in effect, for some reason, I believe that I deserve to and should eat meat, kind of just because I already do it. And I also believe that I shouldn't. And saying those two things out loud or facing them head on is really weird and really difficult. So I constantly reduce my own dissonance by trying not to think about it or saying something like, well, I tried being vegetarian, but I really couldn't get the nutrients. Or, well, everybody eats meat, so it's really hard not to. Or, it's just too expensive for me to be a vegetarian. And in doing this, that's reducing cognitive dissonance. Or, actually, this is a way better example. People who smoke cigarettes, they know because they're told that smoking is harmful to them. They know it intellectually, but because they're already habituated to smoking and haven't thought about how they might stop or be able to feel well uh, without smoking, they rationalize reasons why their smoking is okay. Like, uh, like I only smoke this amount, and if I smoke this amount, I'd really be harmful. So it's not so bad. Or, yes, I smoke now, but sometime in the future I'll quit. Or, um, my father smoked, and he lived a really long, healthy life with no lung diseases, so I won't have any trouble. That's like a confirmation bias, I guess. Uh, like picking out people who have smoked and don't seem to have health deterioration, so it must be fun for you, and just like discarding all of the people who have died of horrible diseases linked to smoking. And you could imagine that some people just flat out deny the idea that smoking is harmful because admitting it would mean admitting that the way they are currently behaving, which they have no good plan to change, is bad or wrong or it's going to kill them. And that's a tough thing to believe or to let settle. So our knee-jerk reaction to reduce dissonance is actually a self-preservation tool. It has an evolutionary basis and context. We should not expect that we are, uh, any of us, are immune to thinking this way. I think we all reduce dissonance in some illogical sort of a way, sometimes or even all the time. Um... It helps preserve our mental energy so that we don't exhaust our cognitive functioning or become overwhelmed. 
and it's actually a protection against a perceived threat. So when our belief systems are attacked, we kind of feel as though something's attacking our sense of self. So we get into a, a same kind of fight, flight, or freeze response that you might when there is a physical attack against you. But we're getting into a fight, flight, freeze response against information that doesn't fit our worldview. And in doing so, we reduce dissonance and reduce threat. This, you can imagine, could be useful to some extent, but usually not. It's usually probably better to be rational, reasonable, and logical. And so reducing dissonance, even though it's sort of built into this, the hardware, or, or built, it's built-in software, it's overcomable still. Um, you notice, like my confession, I both believe that I should eat meat and that I shouldn't. But I'm able to think about that. I'm able to right now let those things both sink in and believe both of them in some sort of a compatible way. But that getting there requires logical steps that are like higher order and to process information beyond an instinctual framework. And it also requires somehow being able to feel comfortable with the idea that you're wrong. But you have to have the tools in the toolkit enough to figure out how to do this. So what does that have to do with South Dakota and COVID? Well, when this group member talks about people in South Dakota reducing cognitive dissonance, the person is presumably saying that there are a lot of people who believe something that's false, and they seem to believe the false thing despite contradictory evidence being right in front of them and all around them. One of the things that the group member is asking is, what will it take to get these people to see the truth? So I have a way of thinking about both of these things. It's the best way that I know of laying things out in their most likely and realistic formation so that I can actually decide whether it's something worth spending my time and effort and attention on or if there's actually anything that I can or should be doing to better educate people who are, who are reducing their cognitive dissonance in an unhealthy way. So I'm just going to take you through that thought process. First, I always look inward, and I try to figure out, all right, what are the odds that my whole conceptualization about this topic, and in this case it's COVID-19 and the pandemic, what are my odds that my whole conceptualization about it are misguided or wrong? Like, am I sure that I'm getting good information? Is there any chance that I'm getting this thing completely wrong? And I try to take an honest look at that. And if not completely wrong, is there any chance that I'm getting something slightly wrong? And if not even slightly wrong, is it possible that my definition of the problem and my prioritization of associated problems or like my entire perspective could be way different than someone who seems to be of the opposite persuasion? Or you might put it, is there any chance that I am actually reducing cognitive dissonance? And that's important because before I go about trying to change another person's mind or even just asserting that their worldview is wrong or morally indefensible, I really do want to inspect my own beliefs for blind spots. And I know that I have them. So it's more like I want to check to make sure the blind spots that I have are not so consequential as to make an ar argument that I might make, um, you know, render it useless or silly or that it won't backfire on me. So I'm, I'll just break down my own beliefs right now about COVID, and then we can get into the beliefs of South Dakota citizens. And I realize that as I lay out my beliefs about COVID-19, even though I'm going to try to do it carefully, people are probably going to disagree and whatever. I'm just doing the best to just think out things to the extent that I poss can possibly think them out. On a simply epidemiological level, here's what I believe. Um, when it comes to COVID-19, I believe that health professionals, political leaders... Most of the public have justifiably classified COVID-19 a global pandemic and as a national pandemic here in the U.S. I believe that COVID-19 is more deadly than the flu or worse than the flu, no matter how you slice the data. And I believe that epidemiologically speaking, it behooves us to think about when we talk about the harms associated with the virus, that we think about more than just death count, actually. It's not clear what kind of lasting effect SARS-2, the coronavirus, has on people. So that's something we need to take into effect and at least be thinking about. It goes without saying that distancing is a good way to reduce risk of spread. 
just epidemiologically speaking. It's just sort of like an obvious thing. We can just know objectively speaking that if everyone could possibly stay distanced and in their own house all the time, which obviously, you know, we'll get into that. You can't really always do that. Lock yourself forever. Then that would be a good way to reduce the risk of the spread. So just knowing that that is a possibility and that that's the truth is something I'm going to lay out there. I also believe that when people are wearing masks, it lessens the risk of spread. And I believe that there is something about being outside that helps minimize the risk of spread, which could have something to do with UV light. Uh, maybe it does. Uh, and or it just has to do with the sheer the added volume of space when you're outside as opposed to the limited space that you have when indoors for the virus to travel. I am confident about these things, but these are all beliefs like all of my beliefs that I'm willing to amend if I'm presented with sufficient evidence that I'm incorrect or that something else is true. It would take much more evidence and a great argument to convince me that, say, COVID is fake than it would to change my belief that, like, masks are effective or something. But I'm up for changing my mind if someone could demonstrate to me with some kind of empirical evidence that I'm wrong. I, I could change my mind about anything. For the most part, I really don't think I'm wrong about any of these things I just listed. I'm confident. But once I get beyond my sort of quantifiable, more objective beliefs, then I can imagine that there's a greater possibility that I could be honing in on something that I think is important or that I'm interpreting data or accepting a story about COVID uh, that another person, right or wrong, really sees differently. And that could be because I'm wrong about something. It could be because the other person's wrong about something. Or it could be that we're looking at the problem from a completely different set of perspectives and priorities. So as far as the conclusions I've reached about how to deal with COVID, from the evidence that I've seen so far and, you know, influenced by my own heuristics, I guess, I believe that it's best that we take precautions in order to keep people safe so that we don't overwhelm healthcare workers and hospitals and so that people don't die. I think that if we do absolutely nothing, just let it rip and carry on with life as we did before, I think that would be irresponsible and that would lead to illness and deaths and overwhelm that we could have definitely otherwise prevented. I believe that one of the least disruptive things that we can possibly do while keeping people safe is to wear masks, everyone. Given the evidence that wearing masks is at least somewhat effective at least um, in mitigating spread it just seems to make sense i also think we need to do our best as citizens to distance from one another for now to the extent that it's possible at the same time i do understand that policymakers can't just shut down every institution or the country can't run uh, can't operate and there is a delicate cost-benefit analysis that needs to be done before deciding what ought to close, what ought to remain open, what is essential, what isn't. And that is really tricky. And that's going to look different everywhere. As it is, I think it's a good idea to leave schools open when possible. But that probably looks different in different you know, regions of different states and different places across the country. But it seems like, broadly speaking, it's a good idea to leave schools open if we can but it's probably not a good idea to leave every institution, organization, store open at this point. I mean, I think we shouldn't be getting together in enormous meetings and gatherings or gathering indoors or in sporting events or town meetings or rallies. And at the same time, I think that no politician ought to close things down without a careful examination of why to close one thing and not to close another. And I think that they need to be transparent about this stuff and why they're doing it. And if they made a mistake, then they need to say that too. And I think they need to be willing to change those guidelines and make them fluid so that as more evidence comes in, they can make the change. I believe that one piece of evidence that needs to inform the decision about whether to close something or leave it open is how much social destruction it's going to cause. Like... If you're shutting down several places of work and people are staying home, that's going to have an effect on social and psychological health one way or another. And if, as seems to be the case in a lot of circumstances, if people are not being adequately reimbursed for having to stop working, then it's 
definitely going to have an even bigger impact on social and cultural and psychological and even physical health. As restaurants are being closed and people can't afford to keep their businesses open um, and people are needing to stay home and not able to see friends and family as often, if ever, it really is making an impact and we need to be able to, in every state and in our country, be really honest about these effects and make an honest and transparent, you know, what we're going to try to do about it. And I believe that none of this is at all easy. This really new, strange territory. At the moment, I believe that restrictions on social gatherings and even restrictions on companies and the buildings remaining open or closed should be considered. And to some extent, it's best to keep things closed, even despite the risk that people are going to lose their jobs or some social and psychological well-being as a result. God, that's a tough thing to say. Um, and actually, at the same time, it's sort of an exact and opposite persuasion, I think that it will behoove us to keep some businesses and restaurants and things like that open and allow some form of at least limited social gathering, even despite the risk that more people are going to contract COVID. And um, that probably means more people will also die of COVID than if things weren't open or their social gatherings were restricted. It's a tough balancing act. And just the last thing I'll say, uh, I'll add to that. <laughs> Jeez, I've said a lot, but the, the last thing I'll add is that I do believe that COVID deaths are being counted more or less correctly. Death certificates are a problem, and they always have been. It's funny that people are now seeing the problem only now. Um, so I won't say that there's there's never any problem with the way deaths are reported. Having studied addiction, I'm, I'm constantly horrified about how people are reported to have died of a heroin overdose, say, even though there was no real investigation into that cause of death. That is sort of like, it's not conspiratorial, it's just lazy, and there's no, there are no real guidelines on it. But it appears that in this case, we're actually not politicizing death certificates as, as people like Elon Musk are suggesting. I do think that we are inevitably going to get some of these deaths incorrect. Like it's always going to be possible that a person could have died and then also had COVID. And that person would have died even if they didn't have COVID. But the reporting on COVID-19 deaths seems, it seems to be counted in earnest. And as accurately as we can really hope for, not inaccurate enough to discount the problem by numbers. Let's just say that. So how confident am I in all of those things? I'm pretty confident, but I'm definitely willing to change my beliefs about any of these things with evidence. Um, probably I'm willing, this second kind of list that I just gave, I'm slightly more willing to change my beliefs than with the objective COVID data. But I'm still confident that I believe these things. How about people in South Dakota? Let's shift there now. What do they believe? Why do they believe it? Do their beliefs contradict mine? If so, what's going on with that? And if I had to convince them to believe something different, how would I go about that? Well, I don't know what everyone in South Dakota believes, but it does certainly appear that they're taking a much, much more cavalier attitude towards COVID than, than my own attitude or attitudes in States that seem to be taking it seriously. Um, the governor recently said things like, I'll never require my citizens to wear a mask. And then insinuated that doing so is a violation of freedom. And the attitudes of South Dakota citizens seem to largely align with the governor's rhetoric, or maybe it's the other way around. And but no coincidence. Um, what was her name? Uh, Gnome is her name. Something Gnome. Christy Gnome. The person who left the comment in that group chat that I just read mentioned thousands of people believing that COVID's a hoax. That may be true. I have no way currently of verifying that that's the case. Um, well, I was going to just, I'm not going to go the Google route because then I'm just going to open up that can of worms and I'll just be Googling everything. But <clears throat> I, I assume that it's likely that at least some people living in South Dakota think that the virus is a hoax. And that is, I think, a form of dissonance or reducing dissonance. I don't really know what it means that COVID is a hoax. Probably different things. But, I mean, I have to assume that if people think COVID-19 is just straight up not a real virus, or if they think that it's a real virus but the death count is like completely fabricated or something like that, or they think the risks are overblown, then they that may have something to do with their own worldview 
and their own behaviors and lifestyles. And maybe to them, the assertion that COVID-19 is real, that it's deadly, that it's a risk to them and others, and that it means that we're all going to have to make sacrifices for a while, maybe they have difficulty interpreting one or some or all of those things as factually true because in doing so, their new beliefs would not align with their current behavior or worldview. So that could be so many things. It may be that they're so invested in being anti-establishment or like anti-Biden and preserving the Trump legacy that believing COVID is a hoax is actually more of a comfortable narrative to follow. And it's just in keeping with their tribe that they're doing so. Or maybe that there are citizens of South Dakota who, if there were lockdowns, they wouldn't be able to um, work or afford to feed their families or do some of the things that are lifelines for them right now in so many ways. So perpetuating the idea that COVID is a hoax to them could be a way to compensate for the fear that these things could happen to them. Or it might be the case that many of the citizens of South Dakota do believe that COVID's real and they believe that it can be deadly, but they just don't believe that shutting things down would actually help with COVID enough to justify the downsides, like being out of work or not being able to see family or friends or not being able to make money. Um, it could be that people believe COVID is real, but they feel that a pure libertarian like freedom should be given primacy and that any mandate is just a violation of that precious right. And it can also be that for any number of reasons, some people of South Dakota have such disdain for Biden and liberals and have so much fear and resentment around the government and particularly Biden and the Democrats that it just feels right to dismiss anything Biden or Democrats support. And they may feel they've been <clears throat> like conspicuously ignored by the powers that be for so long, their calls for help unanswered for so long, that they just feel this obligation to go against any any restrictions that government officials place on them. And if that's the case, I could even imagine Governor Nome kind of believing that there should be restrictions to slow the spread, but actually uh, wanting to just preserve her image among her state citizens so she just acquiesced to their disdain for following government-imposed orders. And it could be that some people in South Dakota really do believe COVID is a hoax. And among those people... There is a mix of total ignorance while also including some otherwise intelligent people who are like bogged down by a very deep reduced of cognitive dissonance. And it could be the case that many of those people absolutely believe that COVID is just as real as epidemiologists say it is, but just don't see that limiting freedom in any way could be a reasonable solution. And there may be a mix of that ignorance or beliefs or refusal to believe. It's complicated. Having thought about all that, I think that it probably would behoove us to try to convince somehow some of these people to budge on their beliefs, if only it were possible to do so. And it would be nice if we could be convincing the governor as well as the citizens. Here's the problem, I think. What exactly should we be convincing them of? it's not a question that's that the answer is not as easy as you're thinking it is like if you're yelling oh it needs to be like i'm just saying at what level exactly would people be willing to hear or understand new information that contradicts their existing beliefs think about things that you've tried to reduce dissonance about in the past and have to had to change your belief like were you easily convinced when people just tried to convince you so the next question is, how would we, if we can figure out like, at what level are people willing to hear new information that contradicts their beliefs, how would we go about convincing them? And in my experience dealing with dissonance of all kinds, the answer to these questions about what to convince them of, what they would be able to hear, how to convince them, how to get through to them, it all hinges on the ability to listen. I don't have an informed answer to this, really. But I can tell you that if there are people in the state of South Dakota who we think need to be educated about COVID and convinced that doing something for health measures is actually much better than doing nothing, then the first step has to be listening. 
So how do we listen to concerns in a way that people in question feel listened to? And how can we respond to the most reasonable of their concerns in a way that they trust they're not only being listened to, but they're being treated as though they're being listened to? To really be convincing a COVID denier, I think that first they need to be acknowledged and listened to about issues that may very well have nothing to do with COVID. They may be some deeper underlying issues about the ways that they're living, which the idea of COVID and a pandemic and restrictions and lockdowns and mask wearing actually conflicts <clears throat> with that way of living and their needs and their like deeper, more underlying issues. So some leader somewhere needs to be well-versed in the language of distress, like hostage negotiation almost, and figure out what is it that these people need so that they can actually be in a position to listen without feeling completely defensive. Then it's important to understand how COVID deniers are prioritizing issues and how that informs the worldview. If we can do that, then we might be able to follow up with some collaboration and starting at the lowest level, um, working our way up. Like I'm, I have an example on my mind right now. Like if nobody, if nobody's gonna budge on wearing masks because they just won't do mandates, then maybe we can figure out a way to educate the public in their area about why wearing masks is helpful and effective, and maybe we can do so in a way that that kind of in, that, that shows in good faith. Hey, nobody's taking away your freedom. That's clearly the most precious right to you. The thing is, wearing masks will really save lives. So we're going to make the masks available and we're going to ask store owners to give out masks and we're going to sell masks everywhere and we're going to educate businesses and the public about mask wearing and give them guidelines for norms in their respective businesses so that more people are wearing more masks, more masks more often. Their choice. Do you see what I mean? Like you can infiltrate that culture with good sense so that they sort of are more easily adopting the good sense rather than feeling like it's being forced on them. Let me summarize that. So communicating with COVID deniers requires that we first understand what we know about COVID ourselves and how we know this information and how confident we are about our beliefs. And then it requires understanding all of the reasons why someone else may take a different view than our own. And in the case of true COVID deniers, we need to understand what their motivation would be for believing COVID is real versus believing it's a hoax. Then we need to figure out what these people mean when they say it's a hoax. Like, what part of it is a hoax? What part of it's real? What true information are they actually willing to acknowledge? And we need to figure out what informs the worldview and motivation, whether that's socioeconomic status, culture, political beliefs, temperament, resentment, oppression... I can't think of any more, but there's like a trillion things. Then we need to listen to these people and figure out what makes them tick rather than just assuming that they're all stupid or that they're bad or they're all trying to be harmful to others or us. Then before doing any convincing at all, we need to listen non-judgmentally and then reflect and respond accordingly somehow. And then we need to figure out where we can possibly collaborate. And then we need to collaborate where we can. It's like harm reduction for stupid ideas. Even if that means doing things very differently in places like South Dakota than we do in places like New York or California or Vermont. So that's my two cents. At this point, I think I'm, I'm getting tired and wondering if I actually answered the question or just made things more confusing. Let me know in the comments. And please rate and review the Social Exchange Podcast on iTunes and the Apple Podcast app. And Visit my Patreon at patreon.com slash the social exchange and feel free to join the Facebook group. I'll leave a link in the description. One more thing. Thanks to everybody who participates in the discussions regularly. I did my best to contribute here and I'm really excited to hear what you think about my contribution. As always, happy to be corrected. Thanks everybody for a great discussion.